Well, good Friday afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good Friday. Happy Good Friday. Um, and, of course, I think everybody knows what the heck's going on at the U.S. Capitol. Uh, we had a driver smash into a barrier, stab uh, an officer. We have one officer who has passed. And, of course, the suspect has been taken out by uh, other Capitol Police. So, a um, lot of facts to find out. Uh, all the uh, all the inside information is still filtering out. Uh, so, we'll have to see what this is connected to. Uh, today's show, uh, during the second hour, Ben Seidler, Ward 2, Wheeling City Councilman. We have a lot to talk about. Bernie Dolan is the Executive Director of the West Virginia SSAC. Beginning next week... Uh, uh, a student athlete can play a winter sport and a spring sport. So we'll talk to Bernie about that program getting rolled out. Uh, but my first guest today, uh, I'm pretty sure everybody read the stories on Lead News, but I really wanted CJ on the show. Uh, he was on the other show for, you know, several times. So CJ Goodwin, Dallas Cowboy, how the hell are you? Man, uh, you know. Better times, but you know, I know living a dream, man. <laughs> Bless. Yeah, I mean, it, it is pretty much uh, a dream. So, how's my friend? Happy Easter, anyway. I know. Happy Easter to you as well, man. Thank you, thank you. Uh, now, how? I mean, you've been home for a while. You you love coming home to Wheeling and spending time with your family, don't you? Absolutely, yeah. I'm, we're a family. We're a tight knit family, man. We're family first here, so uh, you know I, I like to spend as much time as I can during off season. Um, yeah, you really do. You really do. And you know, you got some stuff going on now. And what I told you just a moment ago, at least you're here. You know, I mean, if if you're halfway across the country, you know, you you probably wouldn't enjoy that. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm glad I'm home to be, you know, hard times like this. I'm glad I'm glad I'm good to be home. Yeah. Now, you called it a dream come true. You got a little bit of security at the age of 30, <laughs> at the age of 31, CJ. 31. Yeah, it was a long time coming, man. Now, I, you know, I get to really uh, become a, the adult I wanted to be. You know, I have a security in my job a little bit, you know, and nothing's really secure, but, you know, in, in football. But, yeah, I'm a, I'm a little bit secure in Dallas for a couple of years. So, uh, yeah, it's a beautiful thing. Now, is the plan to sock that money away so, you know, once you get into something else, at least you still have some NFL money in the bank? Absolutely. I'm not about to blow, blow it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm put it <laughs> yeah, I'm putting it away. I've been, I've been doing a good job throughout my career, I, I, I think, uh, as um, either investing or putting money away. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't think I'll blow this one, that, you know, go crazy with this either. So, well, you know, I'll be, I'll be okay. You know, CJ. Sometimes you get in there, you make some money. All of a sudden, everything's bling blingy, um, and then you know something bad happens, and all the bling bling is and all that. Nah, uh, yeah, I'm what is it? I'll be eight years in the league, man. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that bling bling stuff has been coming gone already, man. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Uh, well, at least you got some of it in the beginning. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, you've been making you know, making decent money since since I graduated college, man, you know, I, I'm trying to do right by it now. Right. Right. Now you, the path you've taken to this two year contract, CJ is a pretty amazing path in, in my mind anyway. Um, you know, you, I mean, you graduated Lindsley and then you thought, you know what, I'm just going to go up the road, stay close to the family. I'm going to play basketball for Bethany. Right. And, right. and then yeah, you decided to transfer. Tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, I you know I played uh, I played I think one year uh, high school football. I mean, you know, I just wanted to do it because I never thought I'd do it again. I was more of a basketball player. I come from a basketball family. You know, the good ones are kind of known for basketball around here. Sure. And um, yeah, and I uh, uh, got a like a scholarship, uh, academic scholarship, of course, to Bethany College. Went up there, uh, wanted to play. I uh, started playing my freshman year. Didn't really, didn't really like it. It was, it was too political. I want to say I wasn't, I wasn't that. It was, it was more so. It was way more than I thought it was going to be. You know, okay. waking up at two o'clock in the morning. You know, it was a job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, it became a job, and I really didn't like it. So I just took a step back to focus on my grades. Uh, the next year, um, they had a new coaching staff. Um, they didn't like, they didn't like me. I really didn't like them. <laughs> well, there so, you go. Uh, and, uh, yeah, yeah, end up leaving there after that second year, and um, 
went to Fairmont State and was planning on being a walk on. Yep. And, and, and still with the wish of playing basketball. <laughs> yes, yes. I wanted to walk on playing basketball at Fairmont State. Um, but I actually got into, you know, I, I, they got me into lifting up at Bethany. So I wanted to continue that down at Fairmont State. And I got um, a, a decent size and was playing in a up playing in basketball. And um, I dunked on the football coach. And he kind of, like, made me play football. Yeah, I'm actually glad he did that. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. What did he see? But, um, I mean, what what did the football coach see in you while you were playing basketball? Uh, I was an athlete. I was a decent-sized athlete. Um, you know, I was actually our – in the Merrill games, we had just as many fans as the, as the basketball team had. Uh, we had, a, you know, we had some freak athletes on our team. Uh, you know, our, our – um, the – uh, star football player was actually on our basketball and the Merrill team. And, um, yeah, he's the one that actually threw me the oop. And, yeah, we, so, you know, we had fans there and whatnot. And, uh, we were kind of like a show. And he, and I was the, like, star of the show. I was dunking everything. I was just fast. And, you know, he, he was like, well, you're an athlete. If you're not playing the sport, you should come play football. Yeah. So I'm, I'm glad he's seen that in me. Wow. Yeah. I mean, no kidding. And then he leaves Fairmont <laughs> and you go with him. Right, right, yeah. So I end up having a decent season. I I end up becoming the number one receiver on our team. Um, End up actually becoming a uh, preseason All-American after that year as well. Um, Had a decent year at Fairmont. Um, He gets fired because he doesn't want to fire one of his staff. And so he, you know, he was loyal to his staff. So I was like, man, I like this guy. I like his loyalty. And um, so I kind of followed him up to Cal PA where he was the D coordinator up there under Mike Keller. Uh, I followed him up there, um, was playing receiver up there behind four other seniors that's been there since freshman year. So I really wasn't getting a lot of tick, a lot of burn. And um, <clears throat> I finished like 11 catches for 121 yards the whole season. That, that was a game. That was less than a game I had the year before. And, you know, uh, but uh, I focused on my pro day, ended up training with Josh Files. Everything kind of lined up for me. I ended up getting a really good trainer and uh, got to focus on my pro day. And um, went up there and, and ran, ran pretty well. I, I showed my athleticism pretty well. And um, I got a couple calls. I was getting calls. I got calls from uh, maybe 16 NFL teams that were at the pro day. And, you know, and you know they, they promise you one thing, and then the draft comes, you know, you don't get drafted, and you're sitting at home waiting on the phone call. Um, Mr. Mel, Mel Blunt, Hall of Famer, Pittsburgh Steelers, made a phone call for me for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Um, and they got me, they brought me in for workouts. Um, this, uh, there was two receivers there and one, I want to say, old lineman there. And we were just working out for the Steelers. I had a pretty decent workout. Said they couldn't sign me that day and they'll be in touch. So I just, you know, that was a dream of mine to even get a workout. I didn't, you know, I'm from East Willing. I, you, know, you don't expect to make it to the NFL. That was as close as anyone ever got from where, where we're from. Right. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, so I'm in the gym a week later, and they call me, hey, man, hey, this is CJ Goodwin. We're going to sign you um, today. And, like, I rushed home to pack my bags. I could have ran. I literally could have ran to Pittsburgh High. Yeah. <laughs> <I was, laughs> Yeah, yeah. I just remember like that was just like one of the happiest days of my life, man. My mom just instantly started crying. She, I, I guess she thought we'd be just become millionaires in that instant. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, went up there and you know, the rest is kind of history. I bounced around a little bit, but you know, I'm, I'm still here. Well, and then injury, and then like you said, a little bouncing, and then you go to the Super Bowl with the Atlanta yeah. Falcons. You go to the Super Bowl. Um, you make two huge plays in the first half as the Falcons run out to this big 28-3 lead. <laughs> and then you got <laughs> then you got Brady'd. Yeah, yeah, that's what we call it now, huh? Getting Brady. Yep. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. That's all right though. I mean, at least we at least we got there. At least at least Willing got there. Man. Right. That's all. And yeah. and then some more bouncing around. And then your dream dream, the dream. Absolutely. Your dad's Absolutely. dream, every dream Absolutely. for the Goodwin family. You signed with the Dallas Cowboys. Unbelievable. I said, yeah, we are diehard Cowboys fans. Anybody with the last name Goodwin and, and Willing, 
as a diehard Cowboys fan. And when I got signed, you can just tell, you can kind of feel the energy um, of my family. They, uh, they was, they're still so excited that, you know, and I think they, we got to, you got to pinch them now to make it real. So um, it's unbelievable, man. Unbelievable that I get to even, you know, be in the NFL, but play for the team that we all root for every Sunday. It's, it's honestly, man, God's good. Now, in case somebody hasn't read one of the stories I've, I've written about you, um, CJ, that star, that star real on that helmet really means a whole lot to you and your family. Tell us why. The star on the helmet means uh, a lot to us. Uh huh. Yeah, because we're, we're Cowboys fans. Um, yeah, just growing up, you know, it was, it was either uh, the Steelers or the Cowboys, and uh, yeah, we we became Cowboys fans. We actually had uh, somebody that we, I mean, Joey Galloway, you know, some close close family friend of ours. Right. He's a Cowboys. Yeah. Um, I, like I was such a Cowboys fan growing up. Uh, every number I ever had was number twenty two. I was the biggest Emmitt Smith fan you ever meet in your life, man. Uh, like, if you look at my high school photos, I've been in the football because the 22 was already taken. High school basketball photos, 22. My brother played the number 22. Like, I mean, you know, he, I was his I was his idol, but Emmitt Smith was mine. And, you right. Know, it's just, it's amazing, man. Yeah, I grew up uh, number 12 uh, in every sport because I uh, actually had the opportunity, C.J., to have a, a birthday dinner, my 12th birthday dinner, with Terry Bradshaw. Really? Yeah. Wow, that's amazing, man. Yeah. Wow. Well, yeah. my dad my dad had <laughs> some friends and blah, 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 but um, ever since, seriously, number 12 in everything. It's crazy how somebody like that can impact, something like that can impact your life, though, right? Yeah, yeah. Now, CJ, what was it? I mean, all the bouncing around and this and that. What was the one thing you had to learn to do to stick and to get a two year contract? Can you can you uh, nail it down to one thing? Yeah, confidence. Yeah, absolutely. I always had the ability. Uh I mean, I proved that on my pro day. I proved that when I dunked on my coach, I had the ability to to be, you know, somebody who, who can make it sit on the next level. Um, but I never really had the confidence because I always thought like it was it was kind of like uh, luck maybe, um, but once I developed that confidence that I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to be here, um, everything kind of kind of took off for me. And once I landed in, you know, Dallas where where I really had the opportunity to show what I do, you know, my skill set is kind of rare to, to to be a special teams player and to really, you know, excel at that. And um, once they gave me the opportunity to do that, and once they start valuing the uh, the special teams position. Um, you know, it kind of picks up, yeah. Right, right. Now, explain your role. Yeah, you you know, on special teams, you fill a particular role. Go ahead and explain. Right. Uh, my main thing is, uh, it's called a gunner. When you punt the ball, I'm, I'm the first one down the field. Uh, I'm supposed to stop you from being field position. So when the ball is punted in the air, if it goes 40 yards, he's supposed to stay there wherever he catches the ball if I'm single. If I'm double, if there's two people on me, I'm supposed to either make the tackle or cut off, you know, the wide side of the field, if you, if you know what I mean. Um, the role is, you know, it's overlooked a lot, but since every inch matters in this game, um, you know, teams are starting to realize that the special teams really, really matters. And, um, you know, I mean, of course, I see the big plays against the Steelers, against the Falcons, or, you know, a run back or, or a one side kick recovery. But those little plays, yeah, those little plays when, you know, you, you kick the ball and that, and that dude just catches it and, and that was a 45 yard net punt, that flips the field for us. So it makes the game that much harder for them. You know, if you're, if you're looking at the analytics, it's so hard for the offense to score when they're backed up. Right. By right. their own end up. Yeah, it's 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 very important. It's just you know it's not it's not pretty, it's not pretty football. So it gets overlooked a lot. And then last year, we're watching C.J. Goodwin <laughs> play for the Dallas Cowboys against the Pittsburgh Steelers, and you see C.J. run all the way down the field. Then he runs all <laughs> the way back. They throw him the football. He kind of taps it around a couple of times, and then. Off he goes down the field, and some guy laying on his back tackles you somehow. Right, right. 
It was a it was a fun play. It was I wish I'd have got in there, but I I was tired, man. I was right. tired, man. <laughs> yeah, no, it was a fun play. We were working on that all week, and um, the coach we have, the sports team coach we have now, is not afraid of anything. He doesn't matter if it doesn't work out. We'll try it again next week, or you know, we'll try later on, down on the line. But uh, we went in there, um, thinking we were gonna run the play. But I'm like, in my head, I'm we're never gonna run this play. You know what I mean? And uh. So we're jogging onto the field as pump return. We're jogging onto the field. All of a sudden, you can hear him yell, run it, run it, run it. And my eyes, like, light up. I'm like, no way we're about to run this play. So he, he kicks it. So we run it. So everybody kind of runs it to per- perfection. And I'm I'm hobbling down the field. You know, he was like, hey, my coach actually was like, you should add that in it. Like, uh, like you like you put your hamstrings and nobody pays attention to you. So I, I'm hobbling. But the dude kicks it so far that I really had to get on my horse to run back. Right. And I'm running as I'm back. Uh, Cedric Wilson is the, the uh, pump returner, the receiver pump returner, is catching it. So um, he's already loading up the throw, too. So he throws it probably 45 yards yeah. in the air. So I'm trying to time it out and also trying to look around to see if anybody's about to hit me. So, you know, with that, I'm, I actually – look at it and out jump the ball because I jumped to go get it and I out jump the ball and it hits like my palm. So I tip it in the air and I'm panicking at that time. I'm like, there's no way I'm about to drop this ball. And all of a sudden I look left and the ball's falling into my hands. So I was then and as soon as it fell into my hands, I, I said these exact words in my head, all right, we out. Like it's not even English. I was like, we out. <laughs> I just start running and um yeah, at, I'm probably about the or I want to say it was the dare 45. My back just <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. it was you know I had to 70 yards back, and then another you know whatever yards you get there, and probably about the the 45. I was like, yeah, I might not make this if it's not clear. Then I seen a guy. guy it was actually my my homeboy when I was with the Steelers, uh, Jordan Dangerfield. He falls and flops to get a penalty that, you know, he's, he's a real competitor. He, he, he doesn't, he doesn't care about how he looks or anything. So I seen him flop in front of me. Right. I was like, well, I can't, I can't cut right now because I'm dead tired. So I'm going to just try to jump. And I didn't really get a good jump, but he, I could see his eyes and his hand barely tap my shoe. He like barely grabbed my shoe. And I, yeah. And it's like, he pulled it a little bit and yeah, he got me, he got me good. It was funny because after the game, we started talking about it, man. It was, it was pretty funny, but um, I'm, I mean, you know, we got a field goal out of it. We should have scored, but we were struggling to score a little bit during that uh, during that time. Right now, how many times have you watched that play, CJ? Uh, I watched it a lot after the uh, the game, like when when everybody was posting it on Instagram and you know Facebook and stuff. But I haven't watched it since, man. That's a long play. That's a, you know. <laughs> yeah, I watched it. Hey, though. Yes, yes, sir. Yeah, I watched it uh, a bunch of times too because. You know, I, I've written a couple of stories about you, and I want to get it right. You know, so I kind of watched the whole replay, measured out. You know, where you ran, how far you ran back, how many times you, you could. T- you could tell when I got tired, man. You could tell me I, I stood straight up, and my back. I know, tight, man. It was over for me. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. You, when you kind of stood straight up around the fifty or the forty-five, I'm like, uh-oh. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was. A, I was just like, okay, we got it. It was a big play regardless. Wherever right. I got tackled, if I made it or not, we, it was a big play. Yeah. Right, right. Now, next um, season, then I'll let you. Go ahead. Next season, then I'll let you get to your family, CJ. Same role? I mean, are, are you going to be the gunner again? Yes, yes. That's my, you know, that's my main job is to prepare me for is, is to do that. Um, but they also talked about implementing me more on, on the defensive side as well. Um, I'm, we played against the. Uh, uh, Eagles and uh, they, they had a plan for me that game and it kind of worked out. Um, it did work out. I'm not gonna say kind of worked out. It did work out uh, against running quarterback. So I think that's something they're gonna implement this year uh, with me when we play uh, athletic quarterbacks. Um, but you know, we'll, we'll see how the season progresses. Sure, CJ, have you started to think after eight years in the league and now a two-year contract? Have you started to think what could be after the NFL? Yes. Yes, I've been I've been thinking about that. Uh, probably I want to say since year five, I've been thinking about that, trying to trying to plan my future out. Um, I've been in talks with the Cowboys as well. I'm not I don't want to be a coach at all, but they they wanted to put me um, to uh, 
uh, my interview, what is it called? Some, uh, the shadow, I want to say, shadow some the scouts to try to get into player engagement, uh, uh, player um, where, where I'm, I'm dealing with the younger guys and the transition to the league and from the league. Um, I'm not going to say I, I'm going to do that for the Cowboys, no, but I, I just want to have that on my resume. So I'm going to get into to that world when I'm done. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. You know, CJ, you have a lot of natural talent, but you've had to work very, very hard to get where you are. Those guys, in my, and, and it's not just what I know, baseball, but I believe it's every sport. Um, the guys that have to work that extra, that you know, that extra, that have to give it an extra 45 minutes or an extra hour, um, those guys are usually the best kind of scouts and, you know, the best kind of coaches. Well, I, I believe that. I believe that as well. Um, you know, you, have to, you, you know what it takes to, to work that hard. You know what it takes to, to be overlooked, uh, you know, and those type of guys will probably comb through a lot of the, the you know, the the filler guys. Yeah. You know? Like even in, even in this area, we have, you know, the people don't want to come over here because they don't want to do the work. Scouts don't want to do the work up there, and they're missing a lot of guys. Yeah, they are. And yeah, I, I don't want to be one of the, if I am if I do become a scout, I don't want to be one of those guys. I want to make sure I come through everybody to make sure, you know, that I'm I'm not missing anyone. I'd really like to see Elijah get a chance, Elijah Bell. Yes, uh, I've been working out with him every day. Uh, he he goes to Power the Lead as well. He's an, even in there doing his thing. He has a pro uh, combine actually, a HBCU combine coming up next week. Um, he's going to be ready. So uh, I, if if it's if it's a legit shot, if it's a legit shot, he's going to be ready. He, he, I'll be playing against him at least in the preseason. Cool. I can't wait either. I'm very much. Cool. <laughs> cool. All right, my friend, go be with family. Thank you so much. Uh, tell everybody I said hi, and uh, I'll pray for you and your family. Okay, my man. Uh, appreciate you. Thank you so much. I'll talk to you soon. All right now. All right, C.J. Goodwin, ladies and gentlemen, just signed ah, about a month ago a two-year contract with the Dallas Cowboys, and you heard C.J. He said, you know, I asked C.J. I said, what was that one thing that made the most difference? And C.J. said, confidence. I had to get the confidence, and that's. You know, that's a big lesson for everybody out there, folks, because, you know, you can be fantastic, but if you're not confident in your abilities, then you're not always going to use your abilities. So I'm glad that, you know, CJ, trust me, I covered him when he was at Lindsley, very special athlete. Like he said, more of a basketball player uh, than a football player. I mean, he played one year in high school, uh, but... You know, then he goes to Bethany, then he goes down to Fairmont, then he goes up to Cal PA, he starts playing football, one season, 11 catches, 120 yards, but then he gets a pro day. And a lot of pro teams took notice because of that natural ability. And then C.J. Goodwin works his rear end off and gets to where he is today. Eight years, he played in the Super Bowl. I just thought that was fantastic. Hate that the Falcons got bradied. And I guess that is a real term. Um, But, man, I love his story, and I really do. I really do uh, hope that Elijah Bell gets his chance. He could have had a chance last year, but this pandemic got in the way of pretty much everything, didn't it? So many thanks to C.J. Goodwin. Uh, Again, pray for his family. Uh, They lost somebody. Uh, So, um, you know, that's why uh, me and C.J. cut the interview off just a little bit, just a little bit. All right, we'll go ahead and take the bottom of the hour break. When we come back, Bernie Dolan, he is the executive director of the West Virginia SSAC. Next week, beginning next week, a winter, uh, a student athlete playing a winter sport can also play uh, a spring sport simultaneously. Maybe they go back and forth between practices. Uh, I've thought about this scenario a whole, a whole bunch, and... Me, I think I would have just done what the kids are doing these days, and that's specialized. You know, I I was horrible in basketball, ladies and gentlemen, just horrible. I could run and I could jump. I could shoot some free throws, but everything else, mm, I passed the ball. Uh, But baseball, I really enjoyed, had a little bit of success. So I think if I'm in that situation, I think maybe I I tell the coaches, hey, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to play 
baseball only. But we'll see. We'll see. Uh, that's why I invited Bernie Dolan on the program to see what he expects as well. So, Bernie Dolan, the executive director of the SSAC, he's coming up next. We'll go ahead and take that break. I'm Steve Novotny. It is Steve Novotny Lives right here on Lead News. Hey, folks, sorry about the audio last time. I accidentally hit something. It, you didn't hear all of Bernie, but we're good now, right? I mean, the people in the comments section, tell me uh, you can hear way better than you could last segment. Go ahead. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. My buddy Ben Seidler is here. Ben, of course, is a council representative for Ward 2. Uh, that is, uh, let's see, Wheeling Island, Glenwood Heights, North Wheeling, and also uh, the Fulton neighborhood of Wheeling. Ben, how yeah, are little, you, my man? A little bit of downtown, too. Yeah, that tiny little sliver. I never include down, it because down 12th Street. it just seems so, you know, minor. But, yeah. There are you a know. couple of high-rises in that zone, though. So. Well, that's true. Yeah. That's true, and that's the big reason why my friend Charlie Blue has always wanted to represent the people in Ward 2 because he, you know, living at Windsor Heights, he yep. was the resident of Ward 2. Uh, I do forget uh, forget that every once in a while, but yeah. how you doing? You ready for Easter? I am. Life's good. How about uh, you? Um, yeah, you know, I. we all still get baskets. So do we. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I get a kick out of it. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't want to say it out loud, but I have a feeling I know what I'm going to get yeah. uh, in my Easter basket because I'm not a candy guy. I may have, like... A Reese peanut butter egg at ten o'clock, and that that's that's it. Yeah, uh, I'm not a big candy guy. Um, oh, and speaking of which, here you can have this Twizzler because I'll never eat that. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, that came from Quaker Steak and Loop. That's my addiction right there, Twizzlers. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, I only got one. Usually they throw five or six in the bag, <laughs> but uh, I think Michelle, the young lady who packaged it up for me, knows that I'm not going to eat that. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I, I I love candles. You know that. I mean, I've got uh, the scented candles all over this room. You know, it, I, I'm a fan. Um, but, you know, every once in a while I'll get asked, hey, you know, you, you want to do something different this summer? And, you know, I gave a couple of answers. And one, Ben, and uh, I'll be coming to your house to do it. I want to fish. Okay. I, I want to get back on the creek and on the river. Let's do it. I'm looking forward to uh, finding time to fish this year. Well, um, I get my fishing license every year, and I throw in maybe once, <laughs> maybe twice a year. Yeah, I got to go up to Cabela's and get that done. Yep. Okay, I'm um, just kind of waiting. Yep. To see if I get what I think. Yep. Uh, but yeah, I just there's something about fishing. Okay, when I was way younger, before kids, before married, uh, my idea of a blast was to take a radio, take a six pack, sit on Big Wheeling Creek. And just listen to a ball game and, you know, throw a worm in and uh, crack a beer and see what happens. We had a lot of good old times out, out there. My uh, my old neighbor, uh, Baz, Jeff Basil, a good buddy of mine, uh, old timer, and we'd do that every weekend. <laughs> every Saturday, we'd go out there and crack open a couple beers and, yeah. and sit on the side. And, you know, we used to, when I was little, we used to catch a lot of uh, uh, smallmouth bass and some. Um, out of the creek? Yeah, out of the creek. Yeah. And, and, and you know, as a grown-up, all we ever catch is catfish and gar. So I, I don't know. know. Something changed there. But well, we there, used to catch some bluegill yeah, back the, in the day when I was a kid. But In the river, um, you know, and, and I know people use chicken liver a lot to get those big old catfish. I'm not real interested in catching catfish or gar. Yeah, I'm not either. Um, <laughs> you, know, um, you know, I'll take care of I have hemostats, so I'll take care of them the best I can. Yep. Um, but... I'm just not a big fan. I, you know, I want to uh, catch like the small mouth or, or to be honest with you, Ben, if I don't catch anything, I don't care. We used to go over to Greco's and you know, when I was a kid, dough ball. yeah, they just give us a dough ball. You know, sometimes they, I don't even think they charge us for it. I think they just hand, ask him for it and they just come out and hand you a little bit. Of it and, yeah. yeah. They yeah. did that when uh, Greco's was uh pizza in. Yeah. You know, because we would go under that bridge right there. You can't go under bridges anymore. Especially that one, it may fall on your head. <laughs> That's pretty scary, isn't it? 
I mean, the the weight limit's reduced. It's not a redecking. No, that's going to be a full replacement, right? Washington Avenue. Total replacement. Washington <laughs> Avenue Bridge. Yep. Uh, and that's going to change things. Oh, it's just. If I lived where you used to live, where my father-in-law used to live, God bless his soul, along the ABCs of Valley View, yep. I'd be angry. Yeah, I'd probably move. That's going to be a nightmare. I'd be angry. Yeah. Because, you know, Station 10 can't get to us. Yeah. You know, they got to go all the way around. Yeah. And, you know, it's not a saying. It's the truth. Every yep. minute matters. Absolutely. And that's why, you know, I, I haven't heard it, and I'm real glad that the size 70 eastbound hasn't caused big problems. <clears throat> I mean, access, ambulance access is a thing, but I know Larry Helms, Sean Schwartzfeger, the city manager, uh, I know that they've really, really, really established some emergency routes. Yeah. And thank the Lord because, you know, as soon as this project was scheduled, you know this, I started pushing for the Manchester Bridge. Absolutely. I'm like, you know, and Tom Howard, the sheriff, he's like, put a temporary in. We'll get 20 years out of it, and then maybe the city can get into a partnership with the state and get a real replacement for the Manchester Bridge. I would love that. So would I. Look at all that area over there that's just underutilized. I mean, it's like a ghost town on that side. It's What was the headline, uh, the story I did, uh, Forgotten Wheeling? Yep. And I love uh, that picture that was on the front of that, that story. The, the bridge? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, James Thornton. He's yeah. the archivist that had that. But, um, yeah, it's forgotten wheeling over there. And I just, you know, when I was a kid, not a kid, but a young adult, um, I, I worked at Elby's. Uh, there on National Road, it's now Perkins. Yeah. Okay? I didn't know that. Yo, I worked at, oh, man, I have a long history with Elby's. My dad was a VP, man. Okay. So I... <laughs> you don't know this then. I was the big boy. Really? In the costume. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Until I grew out of the suit, bro. That's funny. No, no. My, you know, again, my dad was kind of, you know, kind of a higher up. Yeah. And there's Steven, you know, uh, I think I started doing it at, when I was 5'10". And then by the time I was 15 or 16... George Borey walked up to me and he goes, Stephen, I think you've grown out of the big boy. The big boy's not supposed to have a neck. <laughs> and I, now, are there pictures of this evidence anywhere? Oh, I, yeah, I would, yeah. I would uh, love to see this. I have photos. Okay. Yeah, post, I have photos. Post those. But, but I have. But I don't have any photos of me without the head on because George always said that was the one no-no. Yeah. If I ever allow that to happen. But I have me in the costume. It's a black and white and it's from one of the LB's distance races in downtown. No way. Yeah, but I went to a bunch of openings because I was the big boy during the big expansion when they grew out to uh, 73 restaurants in five states. So I was at all those openings, you know, and then the LB's distance race, I did the parades, um, and it was a blast. It That's was cool. a blast. And then I was a busboy. Then I became a waiter. And I was a training waiter, which means during those big expansions, uh, that expansion period, I would be one of the waiters, a head server, and I would help train those people in that new restaurant for two weeks. And then we would leave, come home, and go back to our jobs. Nice. Um, but then, when Festival of Lights started, we had a short order cook, Bear. I don't remember his last name. Uh, maybe he'll hear me mention him and he'll reach out to me. But um, I'm, I'm, I'm there one night. I like the night shift. And, um, and then I'll get to the night shift. But, um, you know, bus all of a sudden rolled into the parking lot. And we're thinking, ah, they're lost. You know, and they parked. And 40 people rolled into the restaurant. <laughs> and we're like, oh, my gosh. Bus! You know, because it was Festival of Lights. Yeah. So Bear... <clears throat> Uh, sticks his head out, and he goes, Novotny, you know the men, you get back here and help me with this. So that's when I became a part-time short order cook, along with being a server, because I did know the menu very well. Yeah. Like, everything on it. Now, from, did from you guys years. get many buses before that, or was that kind no, of No, that, that was kind of the first of year. Okay. First year. And then the managers came up with rules, 
Like if I was a server and uh, no buses, then I remained a server. But if, you know, a bus rolled in, I was the guy that had to go back and be the second short order. Yep. And it, it was fun. I didn't mind it um, because, you know, your pay got bumped. You know, instead of just making what was it, two thirty-five and plus tips, um, and it got bumped up to—I don't remember. I, I'm not going to remember. I'm not. But after working the night shift, we would go up and over Rock Point Road, and because when you went down to the bottom, there's a big white house there. The bottom level used to be a bar called Rosie's. Right down there uh, at the bottom of Rock Point. Yeah. Really. Yeah, it's on uh, like the left. Okay. And I believe it was called Rosie's. If somebody can um, update me, go right ahead. I'm not getting any comments just yet. But, um, yeah, Rosie's. And it was a pretty cool bar. We, we didn't stay long, you know, but it, was, it wasn't a bad place to go smell like a big boy <laughs> and have some beers before heading home. Yeah. You know, and at that point, I still lived with my mom and dad before I moved on uh, with, a, with a friend on Mount Toshano Road in a crappy house that no longer stands. Interesting. Yeah. Man, there's all kinds of things I don't know about you, Steve. I uh, thought I knew it all at this point. Um, well, you know we a little back bit a long more. time. Well, <laughs> yeah, we do. Um, but that was, uh, Ben, I'll be honest with you. I think that's when I'm 18, 19. I was a pretty young guy. Yeah. And, um, you know, had a lot of fun. I did. I started working at Elby's when I think I was uh, 14. And then just kept moving up. You know, I got rid of the bus boy once I was 16 because I think all you could do back in the dark ages from 14 to 16 with parental permission was bus boy. Now, where, I, where were their corporate offices? Uh, down, downtown. Okay. Uh, the first place was above Bory Incorporated, which okay. is now DeCarlos. Yep. Um, and then they built the Bory Center, which is now Century Plaza. Uh, the commissary used to be down on 19th Street next to Karen Bowers. But then West Virginia implemented the uh, inventory tax on business. So the the Boreys went ahead and said, well, forget that. Yeah. And they bought a big commissary over in Martins Ferry that's now Stony Hollow. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And my brother worked there. Nice. I don't think my and my wife worked for Elby's, but I don't think my sister worked at all. I don't think, you know, she was the princess. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, yeah, quite quite a little bit of history. Awesome. Yeah. But, you know, fishing is definitely something this summer. You have a dock, right? Yeah, come yeah. on down. I'm going to come over, and you you still have a boat? Yep. Okay, maybe we'll fish off the boat. Yeah, definitely. We'll and do a show from the boat. Underneath you, the you still want to do that, don't I you? I do want to do that. I think it would be great. I don't know. Talk about things falling on you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I hate that. I write about it every once in a while, as you know. Yeah. Uh, every time I get new information, um, you know, the city manager uh, thinks it's going to reopen once the project's done. But here here's a perspective I really want people to hold on to. When this project finally does start, it's two years. That bridge has been closed almost two years already. It'll be two years in September, um, and it's two more years. Yeah. And, you know, Tony Clark has told us a bunch of times, me and you, we're not going to know until we get into it, until we unravel all of those cables, because first priority is that it remains standing. And if we're just being honest, that's we're expecting two years, and, you know, we haven't even selected a uh, uh, company to come do it yet, so... You know, that two years could drag out longer. I sure as heck hope it doesn't, but at this point, it's all speculation. We need that bridge open. I mean, we need to we need to keep it safe, but we need that bridge open. We need another, uh, you know, access point to get off the island. I, listen, I, off. I, listen, I know, especially in the event of a flood. Yeah. Um, I seriously doubt, though, after all the conversations I've had, Ben, that DOH will just go ahead and open it. You know, in, in a case of a flood... I seriously doubt DOH is going to be like, okay, here you go, because apparently there are some crucial problems yeah. with the suspension bridge right now. And, you know, that's it's sad, but, you know, it's the northeast anchor that is under 
Main Street, close to the Bridge Tavern. Yeah. That is the major, major, major concern. So they're going to have to dig all that up and get into that. It's going to be a nightmare. It, it really <laughs> is. But And those anchors know. go all the way back under the hillside, don't they? Um, I mean, one goes into the second basement of the Capitol Theater. Yep, I remember that one. The other one goes way over uh, by the uh, under under the parking lot for the wheeling in. Yeah. But there's more. Yeah. Okay. If you ever stick your head into the little hole of those, uh, like, pyramid, not pyramids, but uh, try, I don't know what they are. but Yeah, like the ramp-looking things. Yeah, the yeah, ramp-looking the things. things. If you stick your head in there, you'll see that there's way more to that than just that. There's a lot of them going in there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. All right, update. Because you and I, we do this every time. We talk about being friends before we get to city council stuff. But yep. uh, update, update, OVMC, Bluefield State. What do you know? I don't know anything new. Um, as far as I've heard, we have not had any any other um, uh, information come back from Bluefield on that. There's no change on that. Okay. When at, least, I, at least not as far as I've heard. When I spoke with uh, the city manager, he said, we've got uh, MOU in place. We're still working that. Yeah, I mean we have the MOU, but I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not aware of anything moving forward on that. Okay. So. Well, you never know. The ball's in Bluefield State's court. It is. You know, so you know, you got to wait for them to come forward and say, "Okay, this is what we got." And then that uh higher learning organization, they're going to have to uh do some kind of rolling, right? Yep. I mean, like like we said before, you know, the the city, we have a we have a memorandum memorandum of understanding. It's a non-binding document that basically lets Bluefield do their due diligence and lets us do their our due diligence and and beyond that, you know it, it's in their court to bring back back a proposal of what they what they want to do, and um and that that really is the extent of it and <coughs> I've not heard anything since then. All right, now uh, some things were explained. Uh, Dr. Mosser from West uh, West Virginia Northern Community College um, explained <coughs> in a press release where he got the information that uh, he he used when addressing um what did you think about th- that explanation i mean i read it i, I think it was a uh, a tyrant uh i think it was a tirade and um you know nowhere in the world does any of that explanation say that the city was even remotely considering subsidizing that nor would we um and so i mean that's all i got for you on that the, the entire thing was ridiculous if you ask me um you know we don't we're not out to get anybody we're not out to do anything bad we're right there's, there's seven good people up on that um you know in front of that audience that that are doing our best to help our community well very very true all right next update 19th street uh property where are we there so it's um you know they've done their um their uh final evaluations of that stuff and the epa is i believe we're i believe we're in um taking contracts looking at contracts it's out for bid i believe okay. I, I believe I haven't followed up on that a whole lot. You know me; I'm hyper focused on I know on my neighborhoods first. So I know, but I probably you, should know the answer to that. I, I really well, it's should, just here. Here's why I know I, we've closed on the deal. I know we finished that. Yeah, I know that Frank uh, uh, Karen Bauer is you know his timing to get the rest of the stuff out of the buildings passed. Calibres, yeah, Calibres, um, and um, you know that's where we are. We, we had the public hearing. Uh, I attended the public hearing to see if anybody had any comment on that. Um, uh, we just had one person that was interested and asked some questions about it, and, and that was it. And, um, Do you remember any of the questions? Uh, this was a student um, who was um, building her, or writing her thesis on uh, something around, um, oh, gosh, it was it was a month or so ago, maybe two months ago. Um, she was writing her thesis on something about it, and she just had some questions about, you know, um, reuse of that property. or I, I really don't remember. Okay. All right. Um, there wasn't any bombshells or anything. She was just very curious, and it was a great forum for her to be able to ask some questions. And we didn't have anybody else in attendance. Typically, those are public comments, um, but you know, it was it was just her. So um, the uh, the folks from the DO, um, sorry, not the DOH, the um, the EPA, um, you know, they were more than happy to answer some questions there. And okay, yep. All right. Now, um, an update on the rate hike, uh, water and sewer. Uh, a lot of people are, are upset about this, Ben. There are. It's, it's a pretty high hike. And a lot of people are asking, hold on, why is this virtual? Yeah. Okay, so, you tell me where you are with the whole 
the whole situation. So there was a there was a lot of stuff online that was about why is this virtual, and we were kind of attacked on that. And it's not virtual. We actually moved the meeting from the noon, the regularly scheduled noon meeting, to five thirty p.m. Um, on Tuesday, so that more people could be in attendance. It's it's it will be live streamed, but it's an in person event. Okay. So, um, as many that's people, not what is said in the letter. Yeah, I think that letter was created and, and sent out and approved prior to us knowing what the COVID pandemic was doing. Okay. You know. You know we can't judge uh, the governor's determination on what's open and what's closed, you know, any more than the wind blows some days. So, so, you know, we did that to be cautious and we said that it would be virtual unless otherwise stated. And we've, we've since stated that we, it's very public that it's a public event. Um, and those letters were approved and, and drafted before that, that actually happened. So um, it'll be a public event. As many people that want to come to speak, we'll make sure you you're able to speak. If there's not room in the, in, in the actual um, council chambers, uh, people will be able to be in the hallway and when they're uh, signed up, to, you know, they need to show up 15 minutes early to sign up to speak. And when it's their time to uh, speak, somebody will call them in. They'll be able to they'll be able to comment. Right. Um, you know, it's a it's a horrible year to do this. And, and I, I fully agree with that. Um, we need this done. Uh, I know the state um, has said that um, they've really directed us that uh, sewer and water improvement projects are supposed to be paid with sewer and water rates. Um, you know, they've directed us, you know, as such. Um Again, we're coming out of a hopefully coming out of a COVID pandemic. So I think that this would much be um, I'd be able to support this a lot better in another year. Forty five percent sounds like an incredible amount. Um, it really translates to, to about fifteen dollars a month, which is still a lot of money to a lot of people. And right. I'm not minimizing that at all. Right. I'm just saying hearing 45 percent versus fifteen dollars. Um, you know, those are two very different perspectives. Um, it's not really 45% of your entire bill. There's, there's a math equation that's built into there, and it was published in the news register, so anybody who wants to see it, you know, it's, it's there. Um, but it's, it's going to average about 15 bucks a month for the average household. Um, I am going to have to vote against it um, just because it's a bad year. Um, but, but that being said, I, it's not that I disagree that we need it. We absolutely need it. Some of our, a, a lot of our infrastructure is, is from the 1890s, you know, our water mains from 1800s, and these things need upgraded and I can't help it that, um, you know, bigger investments weren't made along the way. Um, True. And, and that doesn't mean they didn't make other important investments. I'm Listen, not... before the McKenzie administration, a lot of can cooking, uh, can kicking took place in this town. Yep. Okay. When you have an 84 year old water plant for which you have to fabricate parts, can kicking has taken place for decades. It has. And I'm actually going against what I campaigned on by voting against this. I mean, I did campaign on the fact that our infrastructure is very important, that we need to invest in that. And that's not pretty and that's not flashy and nobody gets their names on the pipes underground. Um, but, <laughs> but it's important. Um, and I campaigned on supporting those things. And I'm, and unfortunately I'm going to go against that a little bit this round. Uh, I, I don't ha really have any reason to believe that this is not going to pass anyway. Um, my reason for doing it is, is I committed to listening to the folks in our, in our ward. And, and I've heard a lot of, of folks tell me that they just can't afford this right now. And, and trust me, I mean, we, you know, it's a hard year for a lot of people, and I get it. It is. Um, it's a hard year for us. It's a hard year for a lot Did of people. Did you see the unemployment numbers, man? I know they're through the roof. I, I mean, across the country, 800,000 new unemployment claims have been recorded. Yeah. That's a lot of people. And, you know, I know that vaccinations are taking place. Um, you know, the numbers are down. The variants are a little scary. We here in Ohio County, we had our first resident pass from the UK variant. Uh, another seven or eight people have survived it. Um, you know where that came from? Who knows? Yeah. Uh, but you know, we just when we think we're getting out of this, we get sucker punched again. And well, it's I, I not really fun. hope we. I really hope we don't lose lose track of of the importance of continuing the social distancing. I know some people are against that. Some people for it. Whatever. You know, this isn't about, you know, any of that stuff. It's just we got to can remain vigilant for a little bit longer. Um, and, you know, on this water rake thing, um, uh, water rake, water <laughs> rate hike thing, uh, water, sewage, um, trash, if it was this time next year, I would support this. I, I really would because we need it. It's not – I'm not saying that we don't need it. I'm not saying I don't support it. I'm, I'm just saying that this is the wrong year. If we could do this next year, I would 100% be, be in support of it, even though it's $15 a month on average, even though it's 45%. Because we really need it. I mean, these things, these projects are expensive as heck. These projects are what are what are going to contribute to reducing the amount of flooding that's happening in some of these neighborhoods when we get a hard rain. 
Now, we're still working on the projects behind the scenes, you know, not behind the scenes, but behind that, that dollar amount that we're working on. We still need to lock down those exact projects. But all of these contribute to taking the, uh, some of the weight off of that sewer system. And, and that really is important. I mean, you know, 10 years ago, these houses didn't flood all the time when it right. rained. Um, we've, we've, we've certainly seen periods where we've had <coughs> an incredible amount of more rain that has contributed to that. But also, you know, we had to close down a lot of those, um, those overflows that went straight into the creek. And that's, that's EPA requirement. This, right. this rate hike is really an EPA requirement. We have $100 million at least of projects that we're going to spend over the next 20, you know, 20 years that are EPA mandated. And these are all part of our long-term control plan. And, and that's an EPA approved, you know, plan for our city. And, you know, these aren't, these aren't pet projects. I mean, you know, sewers stink, right? And so is paying for them. Um, but, um, you know, we have to do it. And, and nobody wants to be out fishing on, on, on the river or on Big Wheeling Creek and seeing something that came from somebody's restroom float past them. And, and that is the case in some situations now where, where the sewers are, are overloaded. Right. I mean, it's got to go somewhere. Right. All right, Ben, we'll go ahead and take the break, okay? Yep. Ben Seidler, ladies and gentlemen, he represents Ward 2, Wheeling uh, City Council. Conversation continues here in a moment. I'm Steve Novotny. It is Steve Novotny Lives right here on Weed News. back to the show ladies and gentlemen many thanks many 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 thanks uh to uh bernie dolan uh to uh cj goodwin and of course my friend ben seidler and ben why don't you just tell me what you're trying to say camera i'll get you there i didn't know if you were on i didn't want your people to yell at you just looking out for you there you are there we go oh you have your phone up or something no oh how'd you know a little blue light Gotcha. Now, when you flip that thing on, did your monitor kind of fall off the table with my big melon on there? Um, it's holding up okay. All right, good. Holding up okay. Good. <laughs> ben Seidler is here, ladies and gentlemen. Ben uh, represents Ward 2. Uh, another issue um, that we have to talk about, and it's, uh, it's, it's something that I'm affected by fairly often, uh, it's the homeless issue in the city. Yeah. Let's dive in. So, you know, as you know, I've got an incredible heart for the homeless, um, as do you. I yep. know you used to do a soup, uh, you know, make soup all the time and, and do that. And, you know, I, I'll just say right out of the gate that our homeless population deserves is, uh, the same amount of rights and, and, and freedoms as we do. Um, and But that being said, we've got to really start getting it under control here in the city. Um, it, as it affects me in our neighborhood, um, you know, we've got three playgrounds on Wheeling Island. And I know this happens in other neighborhoods in Wheeling as well, but we've got three that are that are um, you know flanked by a handful of homeless camps that are they're not necessarily there anymore, but all the stuff's there, um, and that's a dangerous situation. I know yeah. back when I used to uh, play uh, play baseball back in the um, gosh that was a long time ago. What are those leagues called now? Um, little league, yeah, Mus- little league, Mustang, but, yeah, Bronco? Mustang, Mustang, okay. or Bronco. Yeah, I was I never made it to Bronco, but you know my brother and I were on different teams. So when my brother had practice, I'd be down there playing along the creek bank. And I know we don't do that anymore as grown ups anymore. Like, oh god, stay away from the creek bank. But, I know. but still, but I mean, you know, I'd be out there. I wasn't sitting on the playground. I was out there exploring, learning, getting dirty. Well, now that we have these these leftover camps, I mean, there's there's needles, there's Narcan bottles, there's <coughs> all kinds of drug paraphernalia. It's not safe. And so as it affect, affects our neighborhoods, we've got these abandoned campsites that have uh, tremendous amounts of trash and garbage yeah. and dangers there. And that's, that's something that has to end. Um, we've got safety issues along, you know, um, along the walking trail where we've got many situations where folks have been harassed by, by these folks. And again, I've got a huge heart for these. My fiance and I coordinate with a, with a team of people to feed the homeless every single Saturday. Sure. I mean, throughout, throughout the entire COVID pandemic, we've never missed a, we've our, our group, our collective group has never missed a Saturday and we're there most Saturdays. Um, so, you know, our hearts are not at the right place, but at the end of the day, we've got to make sure that we're keeping our, our places safe. And, uh, I mean, how does it affect you? How does it affect you in recent years? I, I get panhandled out in front of my house. Uh, I've got people, uh, there's a, a tent in a vacant lot up here. Had to stop somebody from setting up a tent in our side yard. Um, <clears throat> the porch, kind of catty corner across the street, that gray house. That's been an encampment, um, but 
you know. And but aside from the existence of the encampments themselves, what what are those encampments? <laughs> what problems do those encampments? Safety issues? What what do those bring to your neighborhood here? Um, not a fan of getting threatened while sitting on my porch because they look up and uh, for whatever reason say. What they say, I mean, we're not shouting like, get out of our neighborhood or anything like that. But if somebody panhandles and we say, I, I'm sorry, you know, or if they ask for a cigarette, I'm just honest with them. Man, they're too expensive these days. Yeah. Um, they get kind of obnoxious, man. I'm, go- I'm not going to lie. Yeah. Some of the other things I've seen in my neighborhood have been, I've got reports um, and videos and said, hey, Ben, can you do anything about this? Uh, video from security footage of... Of, of some homeless folks defecating on the playgrounds. Um, it's, it's literally on video um, and urinating and, and needles on the playgrounds. And those are things, that's where I draw the line. I have a huge heart for anybody that's in a, in a, in a position that's, right. you know, not great. But there's a, there has to be a, a line drawn. And, you know, I know the city has uh, worked out a uh, process um, with the other homeless organizations in order, you know, to do this in a, in a, in a fair and in a, in a, just a, a way with dignity and respect, right? So when we need to address homeless camps, we can do that. Um, you know, we we went up with, against the ACLU and ultimately ruled in our favor um, that that we can clear a couple of those camps that were causing a lot of problems. And we agreed, and we put, you know, we we took steps forward. We don't want to be a burden to these people. We just want to find that healthy balance of keeping our neighborhood safe, our community safe, at the same time while respecting their rights and freedoms as well. And so, you know, here's where I am because I've seen this uptick since the weather started getting nicer, and obviously the last couple of days has been an April Fool's joke on us. Right. Um, but um, y- y- you know, here's what I'm starting to push for. Um, what I would like to see the city do is designate a designated homeless camping area. Um, you know, somewhere within the, within the vicinity of the resources that are available, Catholic charities, soup kitchen, and things like that. I would like to see us de- uh, create a designated camping area that um, that we focus on safety, you know, if that means we got to put a security guard there, you know, you know, I hate the idea of somebody's going to say, why are we going to spend money on that? Well, we don't have any choice. I mean, at, at the end of the day, it's about keeping our community safe. <laughs> so, you know, I'd like to see that. We'd have to, we'd have to put some facilities there for restrooms. And uh, the mayor has stated before, and, and I fully support this, his willingness to um, fund a position for a, for a homeless liaison uh for lack of a better term, the, a person that would city be... City to the organization, sure. City to the organizations. And what I'd like to see that role do is that person be responsible for being boots on the ground a lot in this designated camping area and being and getting, you know, getting familiar with these people and building relationships there and helping guide them through the path of, of putting an end to their homelessness. Um, you know, we're never going to stop homelessness as a whole. There's always going to be a cycle of homelessness, but it's it's we can do a lot more to stop a person or put an end to a person's homelessness so that when they get in a bad position, um, you know, it's a blip on their radar. It's not a long-term play. It's not a long-term sure. game. It's not an end game plan. So what I want to see is I want to see us do that. And I think we can do that within the, within the grounds of, um, you know, our agreement, you know, that we made with the ACLU and folks like that and the local homeless organizations, because we, we don't want to push these people out of our city. What we want to do is help facilitate the process of finding them housing, finding them mental health, uh, resources if they need that, finding them drug and, and, and alcohol addiction, um, you know, recovery resources if we need rehab. And, um, you know, we can't make somebody not be homeless, and that's fine. But, but in the areas that are enforceable by the city of Wheeling, we can certainly say um, that you're not allowed to camp here, but we've created a safe, designated homeless camping area that if you choose to remain homeless, um, you know, this is the place that it's going to be. And, and, and no other place. No other place that's enforceable to us. I mean, you, you know, keep that in mind. We can't tell somebody else what they can and can't do on their property um, in terms of, of, of camping like that. But there's a lot of places that are enforceable by us that, that are really, I mean, we've, we've got a case where a, a homeless guy is chasing some kid and a lady down the, the walking trail with a switchblade. Right. I mean, and I've got the pictures of it. The lady sent me the picture of it. I mean, it's, a, it's the real thing. And, you know, these are not all bad people. There's a whole lot of different circumstances. Everybody, you know, everybody gets on the, the high horse and says, just go get a job. Listen, I mean, come on. I mean, yeah, right. Go get a job. The bottom line is there's a lot of mental health cases here that, True. that stop them from being able to do that. If they have an addiction, I mean, we can, we can throw cast stones all we want and say, well, you should, you made your bed. Well, guess what? That's, it doesn't matter. I mean, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. They made one bad decision a long time ago, and, it, and, it's, and it's, you know, wreaked havoc on their life since. Are they responsible for the behavior? Yep, absolutely. But at the end of the day, they still... 
I can't imagine many of them would want this life if they could make that decision in a clear state of mind. Right. Now, right? Ben, here's the thing. You know, when uh, the police chief, Sean Schwartzfeger, has cleared out camps, whether it's because of booby trapping or criminal complaints, and we know there were a number of criminal complaints uh, submitted by the swank folks because, you know, uh, people broke into their cars or homes, or not homes, but uh, trucks, and they took stuff. Yep. Okay? When those sweeps have been held by the police department, we've had fugitives from justice. Absolutely. That are, that are in those woods. So that tells me not everybody is homeless because of something unfortunate. Some people are hiding. There are a lot of different reasons. And those people that are hiding are people we don't want here then. Uh, I mean, you know, I'm speaking on behalf of myself here, but, but if you're hiding from the law here and you're a fugitive from justice, I mean, does that mean that you don't deserve <laughs> to be fed or you, don't, or you deserve to freeze to death on the side of the road? No, of course not. Absolutely not. You deserve your basic human rights. But you don't deserve to be um, in a campsite here where we bring you food and we bring you trash, um, you know, services and things like that. And, and I mean, we're, this is not a destination camp area. And, you know, the one thing we didn't have in place there when those previous sweeps was a designated area. So um, at this point, we're going to we're going to do our best to fund a position to have a dedicated person whose job it's going to be is to work within their other uh, work with the other organizations that are out there. Um, whether that's mental health, whether that's social service, you know, there's a whole bunch of different paths there. Um, work with them. But, you know, we want to see that each one of those people continue to be offered resources to get out of the cycle. Sure, yeah, I, and I get that completely. Um, but what about the screening process? Is screening because I can tell you, you know, for instance, my friends at uh, Youth Services System, when they have the winter free shower. They don't screen anybody, yep. okay? You're allowed to go into the free shelter intoxicated, okay? They don't care about your name or anything else. Now, the Salvation Army and some other organizations are a little different. Uh, but when you have YSS, really, um, you know, perhaps the biggest resource to folks who are homeless or hiding fugitives of justice and they're not doing any background checks, well, that's where we get in some trouble. Yep. Does that end? Well, again, I want to reiterate that this is my opinion, and this is what I'm going to start pitching. This is not the city of Wheeling's decision by any means at right. this point. This is, this is the direction that I'm going to start pushing um, for, and, and it may or may not happen like this. But, um, no, I don't see – if we open up a designated camping area, I don't see us requiring screening to be there, but I do expect them to follow the law. So if there's drug activity going on there, you know – that's we can't just sit back and watch that activity. If there's fighting going on there, if there's you know uh, illegal activity going on there, it's going to need to be enforced. But the bottom line is, is if you choose to not follow any of these paths, that we're going to do our best. I mean, we're going to do everything in our power. Again, we have a huge heart for these people. I do. I know the city does. Um, we we typically don't just go out looking for problems with homeless at all. Right. Um, and we're trying to balance out respecting them and giving them their space and 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 giving them their dignity and doing the best we can with them, but at the same time balancing the health and welfare of the residents, the other residents in the city. Right. I mean, when, when I was elected, when each and every other one of these members were elected, we're, we were elected to serve the residents in our, in our neighborhoods, right? And if the homeless person is in our neighborhood, they fall into that category. We're here to represent them too. Um, but we, we, wouldn't, we don't want to allow them to terrorize the neighborhood any more than we want to allow a resident that lives three doors down to terrorize the neighborhood. Well, Ben, the, the litter... The litter is horrible, and and the, plus the biggest problem with that is is that we don't know what's in there. We don't know if there's needles in there, and and we have a huge island cleanup coming up, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But three of the areas that we need to clean up on that island cleanup are areas that I've not figured out how we're going to do that yet because I'm not willing to put our residents in danger of that's right. cleaning up a homeless camp. That's and, and again these these are abandoned camps. These are not kicking people out. These are camps that nobody lives at anymore, but all the all the remnants are left there. But I'm not willing to go in there and let them with with a little pair of you know. Uh, uh, latex gloves go pick that stuff up and get their hand through a needle. No, I, I wouldn't touch anything like that. So we what? have to clean it up because there's kids at baseball practice and they're right next to playgrounds. Are, are we talking uh, like above um, on the point at Bell Isle? We're talking right behind the playgrounds of each of the playgrounds on Wheeling Island. So Bell Isle, playground, baseball field right there, um, right behind Bridge Park, baseball field and playground. Down right on the river? Yep. 
right behind Jensen's, right there. I mean, r- literally behind the fence, like within, I mean, you could reach your arm through the fence and touch this stuff. So that's how close it is. And okay. these are these are places that kids are going to be exploring. Yeah, I mean, the city goes ahead and uh, revamps or creates brand new playgrounds and you know, mom and dad may not be very comfortable with the kids playing in them, and that's just a bunch of, you know, yep. that's a big waste of money. And, you know, Ben, you, you mentioned, um, you know, the trails. Yeah. Um, you know, Michelle and I were on a trail. We got not accosted, but we got approached. And Michelle's like, I'm not, it was right through the tunnel. Yeah. Okay, it, right through the Hempfield Tunnel. And out of nowhere on the left, hey, uh, hey, you got, you know, and I'm just like, whoa. And when you start thinking about it, when it's two of you together, it's uncomfortable enough as it is because you don't know what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. But if it, I mean, you wouldn't want your daughter or your son or your young, let's, you know, they're older. But still, I mean, you wouldn't want your daughter or your son out there by themselves either way. Well, my son can handle himself. My daughter and my wife, forget about it. Yeah. You know, they're tiny little ladies. Yeah. Um, no, um, and I just. And so we're going to have a lot of pushback. I mean, I, again, this is my opinion. These are this is my official opinion. This is the this is the approach I'm going to begin to take with the city to try and get people on board. Nobody's agreed to any of this yet, but um, you know, there's going to be pushback. All the homeless folks are not that are in campsites right now are not going to want to live together in a in a little bit more of a condensed um, spot here. They're not going to be want, want to be under the microscope. And some of these other organizations that that uh, help the homeless are going to fight back and say that, you know, we're going to bulldoze their tents and ruin their homes and all that again. And, and you know, I like, come on. I mean, uh, pick your tent up and move it or we'll help you pick your tent up and move it. If we need to, we'll get you to a safe area. But at the end, you know, it just comes down to, we're going to have one place where resources will be available. Um, we're going to do everything in our power to make sure they got resources to help them get their IDs, get their social security card, driver's license, yeah, that's housing, huge. That's all those huge. things. And they'll be in one place. And that'll allow each of these organizations that are all fighting over their, their own sandboxes and, um, you know, not letting each other know where their homeless folks are. And, you know, one person might, one group might know about a camp, but they won't tell the other group. The Wheeling Homeless Coalition has, you know, their hands tied in some ways, but they are also an incredible resource. And, you know, a lot of these organizations refuse to even, even help them. And, and, you know, the homeless coalition right now has, has some things available right now to put people on houses tomorrow. Right. And nobody's getting back to them with the, with a request. So if these organizations are angry, I'm perfectly fine with that. I've tried to reach out, you know, my number, call me if you want to talk about it. Now, Ben down on, on the, in the area of Catholic charities and wheeling the greater wheeling soup kitchen and that, you know, that's where the 19th street development's going to be. The demolition is going to take place. And the goal is to market that property. Yep is, you know, having a homeless camp right there a real good idea for trying to recruit somebody for that land? Well, um, you know, of course not. But at the same time, our goal is not to keep this at the status quo. We don't want to continue to have a large population of homeless folks in the city of Wheeling. Um, and, And don't misquote me on what I mean by that. What I mean by that is it, it will be our goal and our desire and our heart will be in the right place to help these folks out of that path. There's nobody in the city of Wheeling that's going to say, oh, just toss them on a grading hound bus and move them to the next city. That's not what we want to do. What we want to do is help facilitate the process in getting them down the correct path. Again, whether it's mental health, um, uh, substance abuse, um, if, if, if there's – if they have a support network somewhere else, and let's say they get discharged here from prison or something, and there's a, there's a support network in some other city where their family's from or something like that, and, and they want to go back there and have a support network, we would, we would, of course, we would be crazy not to do everything we, on our power to get them back to that support network. But what we're not talking about is loading up people on a Greyhound and shifting them to the next city. What we would say is our goal would be to really help end a person's homelessness and, 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 and get this from being the, like the homeless mecca that's written on all the bathroom walls every place, all over the place down to let's get you in and out of homelessness as quickly as we can in the right way. And so what I would hope is by the time that development's done down there, we're not talking about having 60 or 150 homeless people. I hope we're doing everything in our power and being very successful at helping move the folks that, that are interested in doing this out. So you don't, you don't have to go away, but these paths, are, we're going we're gonna to make these readily available. You're going to do everything in our power to push you to do these things. But if you don't, you can still camp here, but you're not going to camp anywhere else. I got gotcha. you. It's within our control. I got gotcha. you. Ben, thanks for coming over today. I always enjoy our conversations, my man. Happy Easter. Please tell the fiance and the kids I say happy Easter. And Same to you. I, I hope Your family. You, 
I hope you get a new fishing pole in that Easter basket. <laughs> Thanks. Me too. You bet. Ben Sidewer, ladies and gentlemen. All right, that's going to do it for us. Great conversation with Ben. Again, thanks to Bernie Dolan and C.J. Goodwin as well. That's going to do it for us. Um, I'll be back on Monday between 3 and 5 p.m. So until then, God bless you folks. We'll talk again.